Okay. Hi, everyone. Just going to wait a few seconds to let people into the room, the Zoom room. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are thrilled to have Cass Kathy Hessler with us today for our keynote. So this session is going to include a pre-recorded presentation followed by a live Q&A with Professor Hessler. And after Q&A, we will present our chapter of the year awards. So to submit your questions for Professor Hessler, click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you experience any technical issues during this session and need help, please contact us using that same Q&A button, or you can send us an email at events at ALDF.org and we will work to resolve your issue. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our esteemed keynote speaker, Kathy Hessler, who is a clinical professor of law at Lewis and Clark Law School. She's the first faculty member hired to teach animal law full-time in a law school. She graduated with a JD from the Marshall Wythe School of Law at the College of William and Mary and received her LLM from Georgetown University Law Center. After law school, Professor Hessler worked at Legal Services of Northern Virginia. From there, she went to a teaching fellowship at Georgetown University Law Center. Prior to teaching at Lewis and Clark, Professor Hessler taught in clinical programs at Case Western Reserve University Law School, Cornell Law School, University of Dayton Law School, the Capital University School of Law, and Georgetown University Law Center. In those clinics, Professor Hessler worked on domestic relations, consumer housing, transactional public benefits, and other civil matters. Professor Hessler was previously a board member with the Animal Legal Defense Fund and helped found the Animal Law Committee of the Cuyahoga County Bar. Additionally, she was the chair and a founder of the Animal Law Section of the American Association of Law Schools, or AALS, and the Balance in Legal Education Section. She was also a co-chair of the Clinical Legal Education Section of the AALS, and is on the board of the Center for Teaching Peace. Professor Hessler co-authored the amicus brief submitted in the U.S. v. Stevens case, and the amicus brief in the Animal Legal Defense Fund case, Justice v. Virtue on behalf of law professors who teach animal law. She also co-authored Animal Law in a Nutshell and Animal Law New Perspectives on Teaching Animal Law. She's written numerous law review and other articles and is now co-authoring the first aquatic animal law textbook. Professor Hessler has been teaching animal law courses since 2001 and animal law concepts as part of nonviolence class offerings beginning in 1989. At Lewis and Clark, Professor Hessler is the faculty advisor to the Animal Legal Defense Fund student chapter, Outlaw, and ORCA. And she's been an advisor to the Animal Law Journal since 1998. Professor Hessler lectures widely on animal law and animal law education issues in the US and internationally. She also writes and lectures on alternative dispute resolution, First Amendment issues, and clinical legal education. So welcome to Kathy, and thank you so much for joining us today. And now sit back and enjoy our keynote presentation, and we will see you back here after for the live Q&A. Make sure to submit your questions using the function at the bottom of your screen. Hello. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Nicole. I am Kathy Hessler, and I am honored to be the keynote speaker of today with you all. And I'm so pleased that you're all with us. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person. And I know the team is as well. I wanna start by giving my thanks for the invitation and for all the work of the Animal Law Program team at ALDF for organizing this fabulous event under really challenging circumstances. I also wanna thank all of you for attending, for participating when you have so many other things to do. And especially because I imagine many of you are experiencing Zoom fatigue, perhaps, um, as well as other challenges. I wanna thank you for the work that brings you here and just say generally welcome and hello to our Animal Law community. I'm gonna start uh, by talking about the challenges that we're all facing this year. This is a really historic year and you've probably heard that a lot and I'll talk about it a little bit, um, but it's true. And so I wanna talk about that because it's the proverbial elephant in the room with everything that we do. And so I wanna talk about that, 
Um, I'll talk a little bit about my perspective on these kinds of things and personal challenges, and then what our responses to challenges are. We have work in common, and we have challenges in common. And so how do we deal with that? And then I'll, spoke, I'll speak a little bit about why the law matters and how we move forward. And so that's what I want to share with you today, and I'll be looking forward to having some discussion with you in the question and answer period afterwards. Before I begin, it's important to acknowledge um, that this presentation, I'm sitting here in Portland, Oregon, and this is a place that we're able to sit because of the ancestors who are in this place. At Lewis and Clark, we honor the indigenous people whose traditional and ancestral lands we stand upon. The Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Wallala Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kailapulya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. We remember these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. And we can learn so much about respectful relationships with animals and the planet from these historical and present day communities. If we didn't think this was important before, given the pandemic, the wildfires, the hurricanes, the flooding, the extreme weather, these are all examples of the urgent need to repair our relationship with the earth and the animals. So it's important to notice. Challenges, all right. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this. We all are pretty familiar with the challenges we're facing. So I'm gonna speed through this, but I just wanna bring us all on the same page and acknowledge the things that we're dealing with because it's important to do that too. Okay, we have educational challenges. You're all in school. You're dealing with online, in-person, hybrid, maybe a little bit of all of that. It's new for everyone. It's new for you. It's new for your faculty, the administrators, the staff at your schools. It's new for your kids if you have kids. It's new for your communities. These challenges are tough for everyone to go through. And I think people are trying as well as they can in good faith to manage these challenges. But they have disproportionate impacts on people. They affect different types of education and different types of learners differently. People who have limited or no stable access to the internet have problems. People with disabilities, people in the arts and sciences, people doing hands-on education. I'm a clinical professor, right? It's challenging to deal with actually practicing the law while we're all in lockdown. It's a challenge for folks who don't have devices or need to share them for people to spend so much time in front of screens. We know we've been told for years, right? We shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't sit too long. Sitting is the new smoking, right? And we shouldn't be spending so much time visually in front of screens. And now that's exactly what we're being forced to do. Um, we're missing the personal interactions that we have from our educational experiences, the fun aspects, right? The people, the food, the events, just the sitting and talking. So these are challenges to going forward and learning in ways that we wanna be learning. We have health challenges. Staying healthy is a new challenge. It's harder to do the things we know will keep us healthy, harder to get the exercise, harder to get access to healthy food. We don't wanna get sick and we don't wanna get other people sick. And we don't exactly know always the best things to do. The medical information we get is evolving. It's been politicized. We're not able to visit or care for sick friends and relatives in the way that we normally would. We can't deal with birth, death, and illness the same way either. We can't attend funerals. I have an uncle who was my chemo buddy in Pennsylvania and I couldn't go to his funeral because we can't do that anymore. Um, even preventative and other care is being postponed. And again, disproportionate impacts on different communities. Safety challenges, the testing issues. We don't even know who has the virus. The politicized information about all aspects of the disease, contagion prevention and treatment. This is a new disease and we're learning as we go. We're not even counting all the populations who get COVID-19. Prisoners, care facility people, that's both workers sometimes in those facilities and residents, ag workers, detained immigrants. We know some of these folks have the disease and they're not even counted in the statewide tolls. Again, disproportionate impacts. For people affected in our orbit, if you will, over 200 meat plant workers have died as of the 14th of September and 43,000 meatpacking workers have tested positive, more than that. We have economic challenges. We have incredible job loss. We have the highest unemployment since the Great Recession. And for people who are in school looking to do a, develop skills for a new career, that's particularly challenging. We have food insecurity as a result, housing and eviction crises we have and will face greater as, they come, as it comes through the fall and into the winter. We've lost the, the progress that we made in reducing poverty. Our recovery will take a long time. Our vulnerable communities are hit harder. 
and we're not even measuring the full cost of this pandemic. We're spending billions in the U.S. alone to prop up the ag industry. And even with that, we're not protecting our agricultural workers or the animals. And of course, the animals, right? That's who we're here to talk about. And the challenges for them in this pandemic are rife. They're getting sick. Luckily, that's not happening a lot. But we've lost a lot of revenue to protect them. We have less regulation, and this is not just in the U.S., but around the world. Countries are taking advantage of reducing regulation and or reducing enforcement that's designed to protect animals and protect their habitats. Fewer people are available to help them. Having said that, there are some upsides, and we need to focus on that. So there are fewer people in their space, and that sometimes has really helped them, their populations rebound. So they may have better breeding conditions in some instances. Some areas have had less pollution because of less people, less industrialization, while other areas have had more pollution. We have overall had less greenhouse gas, quieter beaches, some cleaner air and water, except for those places where the deregulation has kicked in, right? So the animals are facing some significant challenges similar to the ones we're facing. Those are just the COVID challenges. Right now, our society is facing other challenges. I'm not gonna go through everything, but a few things. We're in a time of important civil unrest. Our society in the United States and in other countries are beginning to grapple with issues we haven't dealt with appropriately um, in years gone by. We have Black Lives Matter movement. That's been going on for a long time. We have response to police brutality, which is a part of that movement, but also separate from it. We have electrical, electoral politics. This is a tough year, right? And it's gonna to get tougher with respect to the electoral politics. We've lost Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And in addition to losing an icon, a trailblazer, a leader in the legal movement, the legal field, the women's rights field, the civil rights field, we've lost balance on the Supreme Court and that's gonna affect a lot of things that happen this year. We have international instability, we have immigration issues, we have the rise of white supremacy and homegrown terrorism. If you're, if you're concerned, right, you have reasons to be concerned. The pictures on this slide I've taken when I ventured out in Portland this summer. And one of the things that's important for me is to recognize the interconnection between problems because sometimes it's, it's useful to say, I just want to focus on this problem because I, that's enough, right? This is a big problem. But sometimes it's really helpful to focus on the interconnection. You can see newer ways, different ways to solve those problems when you talk to different people. They have different perspectives. So the slide on the right, um, where you say, see people slandering the police by calling them pigs and saying, eat bacon. This, to me, leaves some room, right? Why are we using pigs as a derogatory term? Right? If we didn't see the animals derogatorily, we wouldn't call the police that. And it's not particularly helpful to call names, right? So there are other ways to solve problems. These are some other slide pictures that I took in downtown Portland. I love Portland. It's a beautiful place. It's a welcoming, lovely, tolerant place in general. And this is what's happening, right, in Portland. It's a very, it's difficult to see the destruction. It's difficult to see people's anger, righteous anger, and anger that we may not think is uh, rightfully expressed. We see violence and I think that's really problematic. It's good to know what's going on. It's good to recognize the struggles because this also impacts all of the work we're doing. This is also a picture I took in Portland this summer. I haven't ventured out very often this summer. Um, and so when, to venture out, to be wearing this tie-dye shirt that just happened to match this. And I had never seen this painting before in a while in Portland. So. This is also Portland, right? There are other reasons to be happy too. We're also suffering from historic environmental devastation, right? As I mentioned before, wildfire, wildfires, hurricanes, flooding, monsoons around the planet. One of the things that's also happening in response to COVID is there are more single-use plastics and non-recyclable items. I'm delighted that people can do takeout and support their local you know, businesses, support their local restaurants, all the great vegan restaurants here in Portland but I'm also devastated by the fact that people are sometimes using all this additional plastic that we were really trying hard to get away from. So just thinking about all of these impacts um, and deregulation is, is making all of these problems significantly worse. The pictures on this slide I took from my house the day before the smoke got really, really bad. So we were locked down in our house from COVID and then we were really locked down in our house 
for another week and a half. I couldn't even go out for a walk because the smoke, you know, it's supposed to be below 50 on the, on the ratings, right? For the DEQ is uh, healthy air. And we got up to 459 in, in my area. So still other people had it way, way worse. We didn't have to evacuate. Other people had to evacuate, lost their homes, lost their businesses. We also have the undermining of the rule of law where all lawyers are law students. I didn't list this out because it was too depressing. So I'm just noting um, that there's a really long list and noting that we also have heroes, heroines, people who can lead us out and we should be focusing on the solutions. Okay, so that's a lot, right? And how do we handle this? How do we deal with it? I do think it's really important to express it. Right? It's okay to say this is overwhelming. It's okay to say, oh my God, there's this and this and this and this, right? That's okay. You need to have people you can say that to. And then you can take a breath and go, okay, either I'm going to work on a piece of it or part of it, or I'm going to try and stay safe and sane and do the work that I need to do. So I'll just tell you a little bit about my background to help you know where I come from in dealing with these things. For me, I've had a couple of significant paradigm shifts in my life. The two photos that you see on this slide represent two of those shifts. So I was born in 1963. The peace movement was in full swing um, and it mattered. It really mattered to uh, my growing up. It was a really lovely possibility to think of peace and in a world without war and people fighting for peace together, young, old, all kinds of um, progress was being made, all kinds of new ideas like women's equality, right? Wow, what a novel idea. <laughs> So the movement, the civil rights movement, the peace movement, when I was young was really important. The other picture you see is called Earthrise. And it was photographs that were taken from space. Um, and it was the first time that human beings had seen their globe. And one of the things that resulted was people began to say, wow, it's, it's limited, it's fragile. We're out here in the universe and we need to start protecting it. And this really boosted the environmental awareness, right? And the environmental movement. So those are really pretty foundational shifts in thinking in the 60s and 70s. So for me personally, I was raised Catholic and Republican in a very conservative household. And I also went to a Catholic school that had singing nuns, right? <laughs> Which is kind of, and hippie babysitters I had. So I had a really rich growing up. I had ideas that were in opposition to each other, and I had to kind of figure out what I wanted to do with that, which, which way I was gravitating. In the third grade, I announced publicly that I was a feminist. I had decided that. Um, I was really lucky to have some people who I could look up to and to help me understand what that word meant. Um, in my neighborhood, I was very athletic, and I wanted to play all the sports the boys played, and they told me often that I couldn't, that I wasn't allowed on the team. So I made a deal with one of my neighbors that if Billie Jean King won her match against Bobby Riggs, I could play tennis with them. I was deathly afraid she wasn't going to win, um, but she won. And she literally opened the door to my ability to play sports in the neighborhood. Like, who were these boys to tell me I couldn't play, right? That's the world that I grew up in. I had a brother who was two years younger than me, and he and I got into a lot of conflict. And this particular incident has stayed with me my entire life because at one point he came up to me and he said, I'm smarter than you, I'm taller than you, and I'm faster than you because I'm a boy. None of those things were true, <laughs> right? He was two years younger than me. He was demonstrably shorter than me. He was demonstrably slower than me. He never beat me in a race. And it was striking to me to realize that his idea of self was so wound up in his gender identity and what came with that, the privileges that came with that, that his version of reality was different than my version of reality. And it became really important to me to have a clear version of reality, something that I thought was fact-based. And so that has stayed with me and I've teased him about it mercilessly since. So, and then I went off to college. I went to college in Washington, DC at George Washington and there was a lot of activism. I was there in the late seventies and the early eighties. We started going to marches most weekends. I was learning a, a lot. I was asking questions, talking to people. Um, and then I went to law school. And in law school, I decided to focus on public interest. I was the only person in my entire class to focus on public interest. I went to a job interview 
as a 1L and asked the law firm about their pro bono work and the interview ended and I was called into the career services dean's office and he scolded me for asking that question. He said, this is the 80s. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> I was just like, okay, all right. Um, I do. And so it's good to know. And I'm not going to work at that firm. They don't want me. I don't want them. And so my path kept uh, becoming clearer and clearer as I went through law school. In law school, I became vegetarian, 86 or 87. I'm not really sure. I became vegan in 1988 right after I graduated. My husband at that point went, was driving past a, uh, uh, early in law school, the McDonald's, you know, and it used to say billion served or nine billion served. And they were always proud when they can move those numbers up. And he basically said, that's death, right? Those numbers represent animal deaths and we can't participate in that anymore. It's like, yeah, no, of course, right? That doesn't make any sense. And so that was the beginning of our journey towards veganism and thinking about our food choices as part of our activism, right? And so we see veganism as part of, uh, as an expression of intersectionality in general, but intersectional work and activism more broadly. After law school, I became a legal services attorney. Um, I started taking on violence classes and teaching them eventually, started doing hunt protests. And so this photo is me on the right-hand side with the long braid trying to have a legal discussion with DNR officers in the woods in Maryland and explain to them why what they were doing was a violation of my First Amendment rights. It was a very unusual conversation. I think it was the only time they'd really spoken to lawyers and certainly in the woods. Um, but it slowed things down and it made them think, it gave them a different perspective. The candle on the left side represents um, my beginning to do regular protesting, um, nonviolent, peaceful protesting and candlelight vigils. When I was in college, we used to walk past the White House and see people doing them. And I used to think those folks were crazy. You know, why are they there all the time? It's not gonna work, it's not helping. And then the day that I was like, you know what? I'm gonna join these crazy people. I'm gonna become one of them. It was a really another significant paradigm shift for me. Okay, some quick entertaining slides, hopefully, from uh, my early days. Uh, Farm Sanctuary, most people don't even know that it started. Um, it started in a townhouse and then they started their first farm in Delaware. It was the first time I had the opportunity not just to see farm animals out in, in sort of their natural habitats, if you will, but together, not just sheep over here and cows over here and goats over here, but all together. And it was phenomenal to see the lives that they had built and who was the leader and who, how, um, what the culture was. It was, it was a great lesson just to be with them and see how they were living when they had their own choices. Protests, lots of protests. So just a couple protest slides um, from my early years because I was going through pictures and thought they might be entertaining. Um, also, let me go back really quickly. This is when you could really protest right in front of the White House and it wasn't a problem. Can't do that quite so much anymore. Um, Earth Day went global in 1990. Lots of protests, I could have showed you lots and lots more, but this, these are things that informed my development. Then I started my life as a law professor and an animal law attorney. We can talk about that in the Q&A if you want, there's lots to talk about. Um, and then we come to more recently for me. So in not this past summer, but last summer before that, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. The pictures you see here are pictures I take of my morning walks. I've been doing morning walks now for a number of years and I take pictures of what's in the neighborhood. And so this helps me go, right? It helps keep me going. So really quickly, um, because I don't wanna dwell on this. The first time I went to the oncology center, uh, folks said, maybe you should think about eating plant-based. And I said, I've been doing that for 30 some years, so I'm ahead of you. So it didn't prevent me from getting cancer, but I think it really helped me. It helped me, I worked full time through chemotherapy, radiation, surgeries. Um, and so I think it really has been important. I've learned lots and lots of things as I go through the chemotherapy. I was appalled to see the single use plastics there, the flaws up close and personal in the healthcare system and how folks had so many more challenges than I did. I had wonderful friends and family, students, current students, former students to keep me going. This picture is from Stonehenge in England um, about five or six days after my diagnosis because I was there to speak at a conference um, and I was there with Dave Rosengard of ALDF 
And you have to keep smiling, right? You have to keep going. This is me in October. This is also me in October. So you have to think about ways to challenge yourself to face the challenges, right? And so for me, I knew I was gonna likely to lose my hair and hair had been actually, I'm not pretty vain, I don't do makeup and those kinds of things, but I had hair and I was not thrilled at the idea of losing my hair. So I thought about what to do. That'll paint my head, right? I'll make it an art piece. I went to someone who did henna and I said, how about like a turtle or how about right some animals? And she said, yeah, I can't do that, but this I can do, this is beautiful. And I did this, it made my students smile. It made me happy. And this is one of the ways that I cope with challenges. So I'm gonna run through now just some quick things that you can keep with you, right? So courage, not the absence of fear, it's how we act when we are afraid, right? This is where we're at right now. We can all help each other. So what are our responses? So we need to be aware. We need to be open to learning. We can't fix any problems if we don't see them. We can't help people if we don't know they're suffering. We can't help the animals if we don't know they're suffering. So we need to acknowledge the problems, reduce our personal complicity, and address the systemic aspects. We need to notice good news. I could have done lots and lots and lots. I just wanted to put some things up for you to look at, and you can look at it later if you like. But notice good news. It's there. It's around us. It sustains us. It's good to focus on that, too. We need to be resilient and prepared. We need to shift away from business as usual. We cannot and we do not act alone. If COVID hasn't taught us anything else, it should teach us that we are all interdependent. We need to learn what problems we're dealing with. This is hard work that we're engaged in, but it's necessary and it's worth it. We need to remember that seeking help is a skill. We're not doing this alone. Kindness, dignity, and respect for ourselves, we have to remember sometimes and certainly for others. There's so many people in the movement who are willing to help us. We have leaders, we have colleagues. We stand on the shoulders of so many who have done wonderful work. We are smarter and stronger together. We can learn from our history, learn from one another, and we're not restricted to learning from the past, from the current people we have in our lives, and we need to think about going even further than we have in the past. So I always say every step in the right direction is a good step. One step at a time, small steps, big goals, right? If we can think of a step towards wellness, if we can imagine good things, then we can make them happen. If we can't imagine it, we can't make it happen. The law matters. You are in the law. The law was designed a long time ago for a very different world, and we need to update it so, so that it helps all the people in the world, all the humans in the world, and the planet itself. This is something you're engaged in, and you need to help one another continue that work. These fundamental shifts can't happen without all the work you're doing. The animal, Aquatic Animal Law Initiative is just an example of the work of doing this. So we saw that there weren't people dealing with aquatic animals, and so we decided to create this initiative to focus on that problem. So we could acknowledge a problem, adapt, address it, focus on resilience, sustainability, engagement, working with others. So moving forward, this is one of my favorite quotes from Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers. He said, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. So look for those people now and be one of those people now. Remember the need for caring for yourself and that rest is a part of your work. It's not separate. It's a part of what you need to do to work. For our work and for our home lives, we need passion and we need patience. Compassion is our universal language. So carry on, support good work, be kind to yourselves, and be kind to others. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful and inspiring keynote, Kathy. It was so interesting to hear about your activist journey and the broader societal shifts you've seen along the way. And thank you for sharing your personal experience with cancer and some strategies that you have found helpful to cope. Um, well, we have time for questions now. So um, let's turn it over to questions. Um, I, I will start. Um, um, I, have, I have a couple questions while I'm waiting for um, anyone else to log in. So um, given your vast experience in the field, I have 
two questions. You can choose which to answer or both if you like. Um, I was wondering, um, I know you always have a ton of great tips and advice for law students and you did share some in your talk. I was wondering if there's one favorite piece of advice that you like to give students that you might um, wanna share with our audience today. Um, it's a great question and, and hard to follow up because there was a great panel this morning, I know. Um, but I think one thing that I would say is, uh, when we're when we're making decisions, we're making decisions based on the information that we have in the moment and sort of our realities in the moment. And it's hard to remember sometimes that that's not permanent, right? And so whatever we're thinking about, whatever challenges we're facing aren't permanent. The successes aren't permanent either. We need to keep working on those as well. And I think the, the Supreme Court challenge, right, that we're facing right now as a country helps us remember that. Whenever we think we've done something, it can be undone. But likewise, whatever we think is unbearable will pass, will move, will change, will evolve. And, and that's sort of like the large concept. I think the way it applies in law school is it's really hard to see where you're going to be, right? If someone told me when I was a law student, I would be an animal law professor, <laughs> I would have left. There was like no such thing, right, as that. So it's not something I could have even hoped for. So that's, I think, a hopeful message in and of itself. There are so many more wonderful things that, that are possible and that can happen that we can't even envision right now. And really the important thing is just like one foot forward, right? Trying to move to the next step. I didn't plan my career to end up where I am and who knows where I'll be in another 10 or 15 years. So what I planned to do was work that, that made me feel good, right? Work that I considered good work work where I was contributing to society in a way that made me happy um, and helping people. And then one thing led to another, led to another. And I was lucky enough to be uh, offered, you know, wonderful positions. I was lucky enough to maybe be crazy enough, as my mom might say, <laughs> to take challenges that people told me not to take. <laughs> Right. Don't do this. That'll ruin your career. Don't. What are you doing that I'm protesting for? What are you doing this animal stuff for? That's not who you are. That's. I'm like. That's. You know. I have to do the things that are important to me, and and some of it was to the side, right? Really clearly at the beginning, and I had to ask my supervising attorney when I was at legal services. I'm like, what happens if I do get arrested at some of these events? And he's like, you don't have to worry. I'm like, no, really. What happens like, to my job? And he. He was worried, I think, that I thought I was going to get fired. He's like, really, it's fine. You, you have a First Amendment right to do these things. But even beyond that, like, go do what you need to do. I'm like, but as a lawyer, do I get in trouble? And I was worried for a long time. And he finally said, Kathy, look, because I was leaving from work, like going to the protest constantly. Um, he said, look at all these other attorneys who are, um, you know, convicted of all kinds of really horrible things. And they don't even lose their law license. Right. And there was a lot of lawyer corruption and wrong, that kind of stuff. And I was like, oh, right. Yeah. If they can still be lawyers doing that crap, I can be a lawyer doing things I think are really important. And I'm happy to stand up for and say, yes, this this is something I was willing to get arrested for or what have you. Um, so all of it, there's a lot of serendipity in how my career has evolved. And I think that one of the challenges in law school is you're just really focused on like my job. What's my job gonna be for really, really good reasons. One, how do you start your career path? That's important. You put a lot of time and energy into it. And two, you need money or you need to pay off the student loans. So that, that focus on what's your first job is really important, but just remember it's your first job, right? And, and take a little of the heat off of yourselves. Thanks. That is really great advice. And it's so it's so helpful too to have that context that that you touched on. It's like this is a pretty young social movement. And we have to remember that we've seen a lot of changes in the last many decades when we can sometimes feel like, oh, everything is so overwhelming and it's not going to change. But it can be helpful to look back and see how things have changed during the relatively short time that this movement has been um, a force. So um, have a couple questions here um, from anonymous attendee asks, was it difficult transitioning from practicing law in a non animal law area to practicing in an animal law field. It's a great question and I still suggest to students if you can't find an animal law job find a law job right and for me being in the legal services. Uh, 
environment was a fabulous, fabulous training because I did pretty much this really broad civil practice. So I was in state court, I was in federal court, I was doing a little bit of legislation, lots of litigation. Um, I was learning a ton and I was learning how to be a good lawyer. I was learning how you know, good office, you know, practices, just a lot that has stood me in good stead in general, but also substantively, right? Contracts, property, all these kinds of areas of law that I think a lot of students, sometimes when you go into animal law, don't realize that's the foundation upon which animal law sits. And you need to have some of that substantive knowledge. You can learn all kinds of stuff, but you don't want to learn everything when you leave law school. So having some foundation, um, and it really helped my general perspective. So when I was thinking about animals, I had, say, a domestic relations background, and I could say, oh, right, I've seen families fight over the animals, and there's no law to protect them. And so when I was testifying um, in Alaska, right, for the first state that did a bill dealing with uh, what happens with animals in situations of divorce and dissolution, I could draw on that experience. And I could say, I know how this works for couples in this process. I know how much pain there is. I know how little guidance makes things worse for them. And this bill can help, right? And so that experience was really, really helpful. And so I think any legal experience that people have is helpful. I also think you can transition back and forth if you need to or want to. So there's the connectivity underlying the law is there no matter what. So in some respects, that was easy. I will say that it was 1992. Uh, no, sorry, 19. Well, different stages, different things. So when I started focus on on animal law, people were really skeptical. And when I actually left even to come teach at Lewis and Clark, and that was 2008, I had colleagues said, what is wrong with you? You're, you're leaving all this really important work that you're really good at behind. I'm like, no, I'm not, right? I'm, I can still do some of that work. I can still be engaged in those movements, but this is important and this is an area other people aren't focusing on. And again, they're connected. If you wanna stop violence in the world, which I do, I wanna stop violence against animals, against humans, against the planet, right? And so it's connected. So I think I don't want to oversell it how easy it is because there's still a lot of people out there that think what we do is crazy or think it's misplaced. Um, and so we need to sort of ask ourselves those questions and figure out why it is we're doing it. And if we examine that, we'll have good answers when people ask us those questions. They might be different for every single person, but they're good answers. So yeah. Great, thank you. We have a few more questions coming in. Um, Simon says, thank you for sharing your candid journey with us, Professor Hessler. My question is, as a student who's graduating law school and moving to a state that doesn't have the legal advocacy for animals like Oregon or California does, what recommendations do you have for future lawyers wanting to advocate in a state like Texas? So you're not alone. Um, and most of us in my sort of age group uh, did what you're suggesting you're needing to do um, and with less uh, support and less uh, awareness. So, so don't worry that you're in Texas. One of the things that I always suggest is find allies, whether those are people, and there are lots of people across the state of Texas doing animal work, um, animal protection work, animal advocacy, and animal law. So find those people, make connections, build networks. Those are the folks who will help sustain you, but find other allies as well. People who just care about good law, people who care about good society. Um, those people are going to be good allies for you as well. So find people who support you so that you can con constantly deal with the people who don't, right? And know that that's going to happen. Figure out how you want to deal with those settings or right? what's your strategy, what's your perspective, what's your style and get comfortable practice some things, right? Um, I always suggest that people are respectful. It helps if you try to understand where other people are coming from and what their priorities are um, so that you can have a conversation and not just say, well, you're wrong because I'm right and you should listen to me, right? That's not usually terribly effective and it's less effective in an area where people are less comfortable or familiar with the conversations you wanna have. So be sensitive, be respectful, but be yourself and do the work you want to do and find it in any way you can. 
a number of students will end up having to do what might seem more traditional legal jobs. And what I tell them is do animal stuff on the side. It keeps you connected. It keeps you building your networks. And eventually, you might be able to build that into a full-time position, even if you can't do it straight out of law school. Plus, it will feed your soul. If this is important to you, find, find ways to do it. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Do you recommend trying to practice animal law right away, or do you recommend practicing in a field other than animal law first to get some legal experience under our belt? Uh, if you want to practice animal law and you can find a job doing it right away, go for it, right? Um, things will evolve. When I first started teaching students, I would tell them, and this was a long time ago, I was like, don't even try to find a full-time animal law job. It's just not gonna happen, right? There's like 10 in the country. Um, and I was in Cleveland at the time, so it wasn't going to be happening for them. However, things have really, really changed. So if you have that opportunity, do know that people will look at your resume, right, and go, huh, right? So you will be limiting other options. When I was a law student and showed my resume to a colleague, he said, you have like all this public interest stuff on here. Why don't you put some of the other stuff I know you've done to help broaden your experience? And I said, because this is what I want to do. Right. And I don't want an easy out for myself. So I want people to know who I am. And then if they hire me, it's good. Right. Because they know who I am. I know what I'm getting into. So I put myself in that box. You don't have to. Right. So if you want to have a really broad range of experiences before you narrow into animal law, and I say narrow, even though it's like a huge, huge world, but from a legal perspective, it is, it is more niche still. So if you want to do that, I don't think there's a right or there's a wrong. Um, right now, I think the reality is what can you get, right? We're in a transition time. I'm hoping that we're not going to go into a full-blown legal recession, um, you know, and it, we'll see what happens with the election and so forth. Hopefully not, but already it's still challenging to find a good legal job. So keep your options open, take, a, take good work. Whatever the good work is, you will learn, you'll profit from it. And if it is an animal law, you can do that sort of on the side and help build. Um, and if it is animal law, you know, both feed in and enjoy. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm wondering, you mentioned a few upsides in your talk, but given the context of all the challenges that we're facing, um, I was wondering if there's an area of animal law or animal rights that you're feeling particularly hopeful or optimistic about in terms of positive trends moving forward. Yeah, I think so. And I guess animal law in general, from what building on what you said just a little bit ago, when I was teaching, it was hard for me to imagine when I first started teaching animal law classes, it was hard for me to imagine where we would be even right now. If you had asked for my prediction, I wouldn't have said that we would have the um, the new laws, right? So federal law, state laws, we would have, you know, felony protection. We would, some of the things we didn't have just in 2000 and like, you know, eight, 2005, right? We have made so much progress. And if you look at the growth of the field, if you look at the number of jobs that are available, it makes me incredibly hopeful. There is no other social justice movement that has developed as quickly as this one has. And I don't see any reason to suggest that it would stop that growth. Um, I think one of the most useful um, things that has happened is, is people in the legal movement realizing they have to, to have conversations outside the legal movement, deal with and learn to use social media and, and interact with the public and consumers in particular. Because when consumers decide they don't, want to, they don't want to buy meat, for instance, or they want to buy alternatives to meat, and when they demand that and the companies produce it, that changes things overnight. You don't even need to change the law. And so there's a lot of different ways in which these conversations are evolving that I couldn't have and didn't predict, but make me very, very hopeful. And also in my travels around the globe, seeing country people in countries where folks would say, oh, they wouldn't care about this. It's like, of course they care about this. They have lots of other pressing issues too, but people care. People care about people, people care about animals, and it makes me incredibly hopeful. So I think that alternatives area, you know, alternative to food, alternative research, right? Getting animals out of our default use system is what makes me really hopeful that we're really, really building those alternatives and the regulatory legal system is coming up kind of behind to support that, which is, we need a lot more work, but that's hopeful. Yeah. 
Great, thank you so much. I think we might have time for one more quick question. Um, Tiffany's asking, how do you suggest handling job interviews in fields outside animal law where your passion is clearly in animal law? And how should we express that passion without sounding disinterested in the area of law that you're interviewing for? If you happen to have any like quick advice about that one. Yeah, it's a great question. And so definitely focus on what the, this organization does. There are sometimes you might be able later in the interview say, oh, I see that you do family law. Have you also thought about, or does your firm handle? I didn't see on your website that you address this issue. That's a way to say, look, this is a serious area of law and I can bring to your firm something fresh, something new, right? This is a way that I can help your clients in a way that you might not even have thought of. It may be premature, right? You have to figure out when to kind of add that stuff in. But you can say, I'm interested or I've spent some time working on, say, ag is your issue. And I'm understanding how critical the commerce clause is. And I see that you work on that or trade issues, right? There's always going to be a connection. And so figure out what those connections are and figure out how to highlight that this firm is doing some useful work or this organization is doing useful work that you're interested in, you can learn from, and you can contribute to. The other thing is law students should always, no matter what your experience is, focus on the skills that you've learned. You don't always have to focus on the substantive areas of law, right? So if you did something in CRIM and you're talking to a civil professor or civil you know, organization, you can say, this memo writing that I did, the research I did, the way I was able to talk to the clients, whatever it is that you did, those skills are transferable across any practice of law. And so remind yourselves that you've already learned these things. You've learned skills, you're engaging in them, you'll learn more. Sort of highlight that, right? Put that on your resume. Highlight the skills and the practice that you're doing. And then the substance you can spend a lot more time talking about in person and you can then gauge what seems appropriate, if that makes sense. Great. Thank you, Kathy, so much. That was wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for that inspiring keynote. Thanks for sharing your experience and all that great advice and wisdom. We really appreciate having you here today. Thanks for having um, me. So now I'm going to turn it over to Kelly um, for our chapter of the year awards presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. I'm thrilled to be here to announce the chapter of the year awards alongside Professor Hessler. These awards celebrate chapters that have shown incredible efforts in advancing the field of animal law. Our Animal Legal Defense Fund student chapters are a vital part of the growing animal law movement. Through raising awareness of the fields of animal law at your school, you are showing your fellow students and law school community that animal protection is a serious social justice issue. You are the future attorneys, legislators, and judges who will be influential advocates for changing the law to better protect animals. I'm gonna pass it over to Kathy to announce the winners. Thank you, Kelly. And this response to a question that I was asked about what makes me hopeful. This makes me hopeful, right? Student groups that are not just doing good work, but really, really active in showing uh, others the way, right? And helping us all move forward. So it is my great privilege to, um, no, to name the, the winners of the student chapter of the year award. And so we're going to start with American University, Washington College of Law student chapter. And now we'll see a video for their acceptance. Hello, ALDF. Thank you so, so very much from the American University, Washington College of Law chapter of the Animal Legal Defense Fund. My name is Lydia Hansen. I am, we are just so honored um, to be given this award from such an amazing organization and with so many other incredible student chapters all across the country doing such wonderful things. Thank you all so much for the work that you do for animals and thank you so much for inspiring us so that we can follow along in your footsteps. Also, the rest of my organization would also like to say thank you, Jackson Garrity, Maggie Horstman and Mackenzie Battle, thank you. Hello everyone, we're so honored to be recognized for our work. As students at American University Washington College of Law, we're encouraged to champion what matters. One of the most impactful ways to champion what matters in the legal field is to use your voice to advocate for those who cannot advocate for themselves. That's why we engage in this work, to advocate for animals with the simple understanding that their welfare, comfort, and safety is worthy of protection under the law. We're grateful to Ingrid Leesman and the faculty for Washington College of Law's program on environmental and energy law for providing us with the guidance and resources to ambitiously promote discussion of pressing issues in the field. 
We're looking forward to another fantastic year of programming to educate the Washington, D.C. community about the need for continued and increased protection of animal rights throughout the country. Thank you again. Thank you so much for honoring us with this award. We are so excited to use this opportunity to go towards getting more speakers at symposiums, getting more students to conferences, and putting on more events in general. So we are really excited and thank you so much. Hi, ALDF. I'm Mackenzie Battle and I'm a 3L at American University Washington College of Law. I'm also the finance chair of our Animal Law Society student chapter. And I just wanted to thank you so much for the chapter of the year award. We're so excited. Thank you for that. And now it's also my great privilege to um, offer the, the second because there are so many good things that are happening. One student chapter wasn't enough. So the next is Florida A&M University College of Law student chapter. And we'll see their video now. Greetings students convention. We are the 2020, 2021 Florida A&M University College of Law representatives for Students Animal Legal Defense Fund. My name is Simon Safer, I am the president. My name is Rachel Hernandez and I am the vice president. My name is Jennifer Agudeche and I'm secretary. My name is Lindy Shamali, I'm the treasurer. My name is Ramesh Winter, I'm the day representative. My name is Andrew Eastler and I am the evening representative. And my name is Heather and I am the prior president. And we just wanted to thank the national chapter for giving us this award once again. We appreciate all the support that you gave to our chapter in the last two years and enabling us to hold the events that we held and allowing us to go on sanctuary trips and give back to the community. We couldn't have done any of this without you. So we just all wanna say thank you to the national chapter for all the support that you give us. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the convention. Thank you. Wish we were there with you. Just to wrap up today, um, thank you so much, Professor Hustler, for being here and for your keynote. Thank you, Nicole, and our career panelists and all of our attendees for joining us for the first day of our first ever virtual student convention. A recording of this presentation will be available in the virtual event platform tomorrow. Um, to click to view the recording, go to the agenda page, click on the keynote presentation session, and click view recording. We hope you'll join us tomorrow morning um, for our stu student summit and then our student scholarship panel. The summit will feature resources and opportunities available to students, guidance on how to keep your chapters active while you're in a virtual or hybrid model, and roundtable discussions on various chapter and student related topics. The first student summit will begin at 7.15 a.m. Pacific, 10.15 a.m. Eastern for our, our folks who are on the Eastern Coast. To join the session, go to the agenda page in the virtual event platform, click on Student Summit, and then click Join Live Stream. If that first thought is a little too early for you, for our West Coasters, we have our second summit at 10.45 a.m. Pacific and 1.45 p.m. Eastern. Hope to see you all here again tomorrow.